Last year, when most investors were watching their stocks plummet, one Wall Street legend had an unfair advantage that was identifying winning stocks with massive upside, like Riot Blockchain before it shot up 10,000%, Digital Turbine before it shot up 789%, and Overstock before it shot up over 1,000%. This power gauge comes from the legendary Mark Chaikin. And right now you can get a free in-depth look at how his power gauge system works. A way to type in any of the 4,000 different tickers and see exactly where the stock is most likely to go next and in any type of market. Simply go to powergagetrial.com for your free look. Again, that's powergagetrial.com for your free look. All right, let's get to our segment today. Hi, this is Daniela Cambone, and welcome back to Stansberry Research. While the Fed's preferred inflation gauge rose in March, now marking its highest level since 1983, excluding food and energy prices, the Personal Consumption Expenditures Price Index, the PCE, increased 5.4% from the same period in 2021. Here to talk about this and more is Peru Saxena. He is a retired fund manager based in Hong Kong, now managing money uh, for himself. Peru, always good to see you. Welcome back to our show here. I'm delighted to be here. Thank you for having me on again, Daniel. Always nice to talk to you. Always nice to speak with you, and thank you for joining us. I know it's it's late uh, for you over there, uh, but I'm I'm thrilled to be getting your your latest thoughts um, today. Um, so the last time you were on, we spoke about inflation, and you you weren't quite buying the you know sky high inflation story yet. You saw it as being transitory. Now this is obviously months ago. But, you know, given the recent numbers, given the context we're living in now, how do you see things? Well, Daniela, I still feel that inflation is going to peak uh, this year and it's going to come down pretty dramatically towards the back half of the year. Uh, because if you look at, you know, the causes of inflation, we had obviously a massive QE done by the Fed and also most other central banks in response to the COVID crisis. We had an unprecedented amount of fiscal stimulus, which was effectively uh, the government just sending out checks to households to spend. Uh, that was inflationary. On top of that, you had uh, supply chain constraints. And now finally, we've had the geopolitical conflict. So we've had a perfect storm for inflation. But if you look at the factors, these, in my view, are still transitory factors. They're not you know, in the same vein as the 1970s. I think the situation is quite different today than it was in the late, I mean, in the 70s when we had that persistently high inflation for the entire decade. I don't think we're in a similar situation right now. I, th I believe that most of these factors which cause inflation to spike are basically on their way out. And we are likely to see a much lower CPI print in the back half of the year and lower still next year. So I, those are trans can be transitory factors, but what about the, the, the money supply, the excess money supply in the system? Well, obviously the Fed, you know, ramped up the money supply growth in response to COVID. And we had a huge QE, the money supply basically went through the roof. And now the Fed is tightening. So they basically ended QE. They're going to raise interest rates and the financial conditions are going to get tighter. I don't think we're going to get fiscal stimulus uh, next year, um, you know, we've already basically seen peak liquidity on the supply chain front. You know, the supply chains are gradually coming back online after the disruptions due to COVID. So all the factors which basically cause this inflationary spike are likely to recede over the next few months. And monetary policy works with a lag, as you know, Daniela. So when the, whenever the Fed eases, the effects of that easing basically become evident uh, several months down the road. And likewise, when you have monetary tightening, the effects of those tightening are also uh, become evident in the economy, etc., uh, with a lag. So I think we are going to see inflation coming down in the second half of the year. And the reason why I think that this era is not the same as the 1970s is because if you look at the money velocity, the money velocity is now really at a multi-decade low. And if you look at the demographics, are uh, you know very different. If you look at the debt levels all over the world, they're very different. You know, the, we already have a massive uh, debt bubble uh, in most of the world. So you have a huge debt overhang, which wasn't there in the 70s. So whenever you have a huge amount of debt and aging populations and money velocity at multi-decade lows, these are very different uh, scenarios when compared to the 1970s. 
when the debt levels were lower and the money velocity was quite high. So I hear what you're saying about the transitory factors, but if we hone in on uh, the, the interest rates, right? It, will it be enough what the Fed's looking to do, even if it's 50 basis points in May, to help combat inflation? Or, or are they just too behind the curve? Uh, I think they're going to have to hike uh, this year. Uh, but I'll be very surprised if the Fed funds rate goes any higher than the high from the previous cycle. If my view is right, then I think, you know, we're going to hit maybe 200 basis points or uh, thereabouts, so maybe 225 basis points or maximum 250 basis points on the Fed funds rate before the economy is going to basically implode because the debt levels are a lot higher. And also don't forget the government debt levels are super high also. So if interest rates were to spike and stay high for an extended period of time, that's going to create enormous problems, not only for the US, but also most of the G7 countries, which have massive debt burdens. So I think the economy and the government is not going to be able to tolerate very high interest rates and neither will households. So I think interest rates are going to go up over the next few months. And when the economy basically uh, contracts or there is a massive deceleration in the economy, which I think is likely uh, in, in the middle of this year, then I think interest rates are going to fall. Uh, I don't think we're going to see interest rates like the 70s uh, anytime soon. Okay, let's talk about what you just said, the economy decelerating. So um, the five-year Treasury yield uh, inverted earlier this week and uh, went above the 30-year yield, a market distortion that's often happened uh, before economic recession. So uh, what are your thoughts on, on a recession? Is that a likelihood for you? It's too early uh, to say for with any certainty because the one uh, spread that I watch on the yield curve, Daniel, that is the 2 and 10. So the yield curve, the spread between the two-year treasury yield and the 10-year treasury yield. And I've done extensive studies and research on this. And what I've found is that if the 10 and 2 year treasury yield curve inverts or the spread inverts uh, for 90 consecutive days. That has historically been a reliable recession uh, you know, signal. So if you've had a fleeting inversion of maybe 10 days or 15, 20 days and then the yield curve has become normal again, that has not been a reliable recession indicator that has been you know, in basketball terms, a head fake. So we're not actually in inversion territory now, although the yield curve, basically the spread did invert for a brief period of time intraday. It closed above the zero level and we are still above the zero level. So if the spread goes negative and the 10 year and two year US Treasury spread inverts uh, for an extended period of time, that would suggest that a recession is likely, you know, 12 to 18 months down the road. But at the moment, we're not there yet. So, I mean, the jury is still out whether we're going to get a recession or not. Okay. Um, let's talk commodities now. And I just want to bring up a recent tweet of yours. You said, oh, a couple of weeks ago, many were forecasting World War III and a global depression. They were also urging others to sell high growth stocks and pile into commodities. Never pays to bet against humanity. So you're right. There, there, there's been a huge bullish case uh, built for commodities. Uh, let's get your take on it. Well, commodities have benefited like all other assets from the QE and the money printing we've seen and the fiscal stimulus and so forth. And this huge tide of liquidity has benefited every asset class. So whether you look at stocks, they had a huge run up. The growth stocks went ballistic. They were a five to six, eight X, 10 X in a year and a half. The SPACs went vertical. Cryptocurrencies went through the roof because of the excess liquidity and very loose financial conditions. Real estate was booming, still booming in many, many countries because of uh, money printing and monetary inflation and excess liquidity. And because of that, commodities have also benefited. And now commodities have had a second win because of what's going on between Russia and Ukraine. Russia's invasion of Ukraine has basically caused commodities to be even higher, especially crude oil. But in my view, this is late stage, late cycle behavior. Uh, I think as soon as any uh, positive news comes out of Russia and Ukraine, Daniel, I think there's going to be a big washout in the commodity space. So I really wouldn't be chasing commodities here. I think commodity prices are likely to come down as soon as there is any positive development in Russia and Ukraine. And we are probably going to see a big decline in commodities uh, towards the middle of this year. And I think 
if I, if my view is correct, then I think at some point in the back half of this year, the Fed is going to basically reverse course and ease again because the problems in the economy are going to be so severe by then. They're going to have to basically, you know, change track and change tune and start easing again or become less hawkish. And I think that would be the time to buy commodities because I think the next leg higher in commodities is going to come after a big decline, not from here. So, Peru, let's say there is a resolution soon. We all hope for that. But the sanctions, the repercussions of the sanctions may live on for a long time. So what happens if if Russia says, hey, we're not going to be exporting our goods? Won't that still build a bullish case for certain commodities? Well, it's not going to go away overnight. But I think the Russians also realize that they need to basically generate some business. You know, they can't just isolate themselves from the rest of the world and say, well, we're not going to sell our resources to the rest of the world because they're going to have severe problems as it is because of the sanctions they've been cornered and rightly so but you know if they stop selling their stuff to the rest of the world they're going to have a massive depression and a problem you know to face in terms of the economy to feed their own people so i think yes you know you are going to see some upward pressure on commodities until this problem is resolved but i think once any whiff comes out that you know this conflict is ending I believe that commodity prices are going to have a massive pullback over the next few months. Does that include gold, Peru, for you? Gold, I think, is a bit of a different animal because it hasn't really benefited that much. Uh, you know, when you look at the grains or the crude oil, etc., natural gas, they've gone up a lot more than gold. And gold has been a bit of a funny beast because, you know, the crypto space has actually taken a lot of capital which would have normally gone into gold and silver. So, you know, if you look at the young generation now, they all want to hold Bitcoin and Ethereum and the other coins. They are not interested in buying gold and silver. So gold has actually lost some of its safe haven luster because of cryptocurrencies. You know, I'm not saying whether it's right or wrong. You know, it is what it is. But I think if we do get a slowdown in the economy, like I think is likely to happen, and if commodities come under pressure, I think gold may actually go down less. I think it will go down some anyway, but I think it's going to be much less than the declines I foresee in crude oil and grains and some of the other stuff, which is now very elevated. Uh, you mentioned Bitcoin, so let's go there for, for a bit. Uh, <laughs> the last time you were on, uh, you, you took a lot of heat. People were saying, Peru, you're just salty uh, because you don't, you don't believe in Bitcoin or maybe you, he missed it. Uh, have you had a change of heart in terms of Bitcoin since we last spoke? Uh, no. And I'm not salty, you know, I've done pretty well with my own investments. So whoever's <laughs> saying I'm salty, they are, mis- I mean, they are sort of um, mistaken. I mean, my annualized return for my own equity portfolio is north of 40%, going back six, seven years. So it's not like I've basically, you know, sat in cash and seen <laughs> other people make money. I've done reasonably well. So it's not a question of my own personal finances or anything like that. You know, if you want to speculate in crypto, by all means, you know, do it. But just be mindful of the fact that, you know, you are basically relying on the kindness of strangers. You are betting that somebody is going to be willing to basically pay a much higher price for your crypto than you paid. And, you know, unlike uh, a productive asset such as a company or, or, you know, a farmland or any property with a tenant in there, crypto does not produce any cash flow. You know, there is no cash flow, there is no business, this is not a productive asset. Bitcoin is actually being hoarded right now as a store of value because of its scarcity value. And I get that, you know, but at the end of the day, if you look at a 200 year chart of all the assets in the world, you will realize very quickly that, you know, equities have been the best performing asset class over 200 years. And it's not even a contest. You know, equities have basically killed every other asset class, including gold, silver, cash, fixed income, treasuries, you name it. And I think, you know, over time, my bet is that companies, world-class companies, and even the S&P is going to outperform uh, cryptocurrency by a long shot. It may not happen now because, you know, cryptocurrency still is very young. So, you know, we have that discovery phase where it's becoming more mainstream. But I think, you know, over the next 20, 30 years, I think the returns from you know, stocks are going to be greater than Bitcoin because at some point, Bitcoin is going to be fully priced. You know, you're not going to go and achieve hundreds of thousands of percents of gains every single year into perpetuity. At some point, you know, the asset class will become large enough that you're not going to get those outsized gains anymore. And, you know, just because something has gone up 1000% doesn't make it 
a viable you know investment it is a speculation if you want to basically speculate on the world's liquidity and central banks then by all means you know invest speculate in cryptocurrency and stick in whatever you can afford to lose or go watch go down 50 60 percent but you know it's not for me personally so then do you not think you know that bitcoin trades um like risk assets then like the s p i mean it is a risk asset it is a highly volatile high beta risk asset and that's my problem you know with some of the bitcoin bulls because they market bitcoin as a safe haven they say you know it's an insurance policy you grow own yep. it you know there's nothing like it but if you look at the data the data doesn't support their you know bullish case uh, if you look at you know the correlation between the s p or the stock market and bitcoin there's a fairly obvious correlation between the two and Bitcoin just goes up a lot more than uh, the S&P does, and it comes down a lot more. So, for example, you know, when we have this decline in the equity market and also in the high growth space, especially since November, what did Bitcoin do? It also fell by about 50 percent. You know, it did not act as a store of value or a portfolio diversifier or a portfolio hedge because it came down with all the other risk assets. And when you have excess liquidity and extremely loose monetary policies all over the world, then Bitcoin goes up a lot more than the other risk assets. So as far as I'm concerned, it's just a high beta play on global liquidity is not a safe haven. It's not an asset or investment or, you know, worthy asset. It's a speculation. And if you want to speculate with your hard earned money, with a small percentage or a large percentage, you know, I'm not there to judge anybody, but at least know what you're getting involved in. It is not a safe haven it's just a, a, you know a speculation on liquidity okay so on that note you're you're bullish the s p um long term here i mean over the long run yes i mean if you look at the past performance of the s p going back 50 40 60 years the annualized return on the s p has been about nine and a half ten percent per year i mean obviously some years have been terrible some years have been much better than that but the annualized compounded return has, always, has been almost 10% a year, which has been pretty fantastic. It's a lot higher than fixed income. It's a lot higher than treasuries. It's a lot higher than gold or silver. So I think over time, equities will continue to be the best performing asset class over the next 20, 30, 40 years. And I think, you know, investors will do their homework and they and who are able to identify world-class businesses with long growth runways are probably going to continue to outperform even the indices. So I still think that, you know, productive assets, i.e. companies and especially world-class companies are continue to, you know, do very, very well over the long run. So Peru, when, when people talk of, well, you know, how much longer can this go on? How, you know, how long, much longer can the Fed keep this party going in equities? What's your response to that? I mean, that, if you're saying, you know, 20, 30 years out, we're still going to see good returns from the S&P. How does it last that long? It will last that long simply because if you look at corporate earnings, Daniela, the corporate earnings have continued to increase. You know, you have population growth, you have urbanization in the developing world. Uh, you know, hundreds of millions of people have been lifted out of poverty and people's income levels per capita, GDP levels and so forth are increasing over time, or at least they have increased over the last you know, 30, 40, 50, 100 years in most countries. And on top of that, you know, you have innovation going on and you have, you know, the best minds in the business world running these corporations which sell their goods and services to human beings, which basically rely on their services and people pay for this stuff. And because of monetary inflation, you know, the good companies are able to maintain their pricing. So they have pricing power, you know, if inflation goes up, then they jack up the price of the goods and services. So that's why, you know, companies will continue to do well, especially the good companies their market caps will continue to grow simply because the revenues and earnings and cash flows are, keep, are will keep rising over time, you know, as they have done over the last 50 or 100 years. Okay, and now speaking about stuff Peru likes, uh, your long data dog, and we saw the news that Microsoft's Azure Cloud is adopting a data dog. What makes you so hot on this stock? Well, data dog is the leader in the observability uh, space, you know, they're a cloud leader. And if you look at what's happening in the world, uh, Daniela, more and more business is being now done online. You know, as humans, we are spending more and more time on the computers, on the internet. You know, people play games on the internet, shopping is done on the internet, dating is done on the internet, banking is done on the internet, people watch films, documentaries on the internet. So everything is going online. 
companies are also migrating online. You know, before they used to keep stuff in their back office. Now they then they move to the servers. Now they're moving to the cloud. So there is a massive shift going on at all levels, whether it's the households or the companies where everything is going online. And the companies which are basically enabling this move, uh, they are likely to make a fortune over the next 10 years or so. And I think Datadog is one such company. So for me, as an investor, I'm looking at those areas where there is a massive you know, tailwind behind us and massive runway where these companies are going to continue to grow for the next 10, 15, 20 years. And some of the themes that I really like are e-commerce, uh, cloud computing, uh, software as a service, and also uh, if you look at online payments, fintech and so forth, uh, these are the areas that I'm personally focusing on. And uh, EVs is uh, another area, you know, uh, the, most of the world's fleet is going to be electric in 20, 30 years from now. And a very small percentage is currently electric, you know, uh, the ICE engines are going to be thrown out. So these are some of the shifts that I'm looking at. And, I, and if you invest in the world's best companies and the best businesses, which are at the forefront of these changes, I think investors are going to do pretty well. I wouldn't be surprised if the shareholders of these amazing companies can compound their capital at over 20% a year over the next 10 years. What about companies that you know were basically slashed in half, You know, like Square, for example? Do you see, a, could they make a, a comeback here? Uh, for sure. I mean, the reason why they fell so hard is because they went up so much, Daniela. You know, a lot of these companies went up 5x, 6x, 8x in a year, 15 months because of the QE and the tailwinds that they had because of the COVID lockdowns and so forth. So we had this situation where most of these companies were fairly valued or slightly cheap during the COVID crash. And then the Fed came with the bazooka and basically printed, you know, trillions and trillions of dollars. And then the market caps of these companies basically went gangbusters, went up six, eight, ten x in a year, which was absurd. So they became a massive bubble. And then the Fed turned around and said, you know, we've got inflation, we're going to tighten things, and we're going to end QE. And that was the trigger for the bubble to pop. And most of these stocks basically gave up fifty to sixty, seventy percent, seventy five percent of their gains in some cases. And now they've been, you know, building bases and getting ready for the next uh, massive rally. I think. You know, the valuations for a lot of these companies right now are pretty fair and investors who, you know, have their courage to buy now and go against the herd and buy shares in these companies are likely to capture pretty much the entire business growth from these companies over the next 10 years or so, because I don't think valuations are going to compress any further. So if you're a shareholder and if these companies, you know, grow their cash flows at 20, 30 percent per, per annum over the next five to six years as a shareholder, you know, that's what you will achieve, uh, you know, after factoring in a little bit of dilution. So my money is on these companies. I may be wrong, of course, you know, you, there is no guarantee in this business, as you know, but I think that shareholders in these companies are going to do pretty well over the next five years or so. You mentioned the bubble. So let's end it um, with another topic you've been writing a lot about, um, Hong Kong's property bubble. Um, you, you actually had an interesting uh, tweet that I found fascinating about the number of years of income needed to buy a home in cities around the world. Um, I actually thought New York, I lived there, <laughs> would be a greater number of years. <laughs> but um, interesting here. So if history is any guide for the Hong Kong housing market right now, it's going to end in tears. Yeah, it will end in tears. I mean, I'm not smart enough to tell you when, but I know what will happen. I mean, property prices are going to go down significantly or incomes will have to catch up a lot. And I don't see any reason to believe why incomes are going to suddenly spike in Hong Kong, which is why I think, you know, the property prices are going to have to adjust downwards simply because, you know, we've had some political changes here in the city over the last couple of years with the national security law. And, you know, we've had the protests, we've had the COVID uh, regulations here, which are some of the strictest in the world. And this has basically caused a lot of expats to leave the city and not only expatriates, but also uh, tens of thousands of wealthy uh, Chinese families have left Hong Kong and they've basically migrated to other countries uh, for whatever reason. So, you know, people are not coming into the city. Uh, you know, the people who had the means are thinking of, you know, finding uh, a new life somewhere else. Uh, and also, as I said, you know, housing is so unaffordable here. The data shows that it takes... 24 years of income to buy a home in Hong Kong. And when you compare that with New York or London, the ratio is only eight. 
And if you look at some of the other you know, cities which are bubbling in Australia and so forth, the ratio is about 12 or 13 or 15 in Sydney. And even in Vancouver, it's 11 or 12. So by any stretch of imagination, Hong Kong's property market is very, very inflated. And I think it is only a matter of time before we are going to see a downward adjustment because there is no example in history where an asset class has become so unaffordable, especially real estate, and it has somehow managed to you know, avoid the inevitable bust. So I think Hong Kong property is a ticking time bomb and there is going to be a sharp adjustment. And the other thing to bear in mind also, Daniela, in Hong Kong, you don't get uh, fixed rate mortgages. You know, For example, in the US, you can take a 30 year fixed rate mortgage, mm -hmm. so whatever happens to interest rates, mm -hmm. you don't really care because your mortgage rate is fixed. In Hong Kong, there is no such thing. So all the debt here, is variable. And if you look at the household debt to GDP ratio in Hong Kong, it's very, very high. It's at 92%, 52% higher than the bubble uh, top in 1997. And you know that people wow. say that Hong Kong is fine because there is not much debt here and so forth. That is not true. 92% debt to GDP ratio. And out of all the household debt, roughly 65, 70% uh, is actually uh, mortgage debt. So Hong Kong is basically, uh, in my view, quite vulnerable to a sharp uh, adjustment in property prices downwards. Um, just a side note, I'm surprised that Toronto is not on that top 10 list. Yeah, I mean, it's around 10 or 11, Anyhow. but it's not um, 24. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, uh, Peru, bring it home for us. Fascinating discussion. Truly appreciate your thoughts. Just, you know, final thoughts for our investors and viewers watching here. Well, I think, you know, like anything, uh, you know, buy fear and sell euphoria. Uh, that has always worked. Uh, and if you look at the euphoria today, you know, it's in crude oil, natural gas, grains and stuff like that. And the fear is in the stuff which is smashed down 60, 70, 80 percent, which is basically the technology uh, stocks, the high growth tech stocks, which have been taken to the cleaners over the last four or five months. So, I mean, I've always invested that way. I feel more comfortable when I'm buying when others are selling and when people are, you know, very euphoric and they're basically, you know, trying to jump on one another to pay a high, high price. I become very nervous because I know, you know, usually such parties end very badly. So I would, you know, try and look at things objectively. Obviously, stuff which has already gone up in a parabolic fashion over the last few months is more risky and vulnerable to a downward correction. And similarly, stuff which has already smashed down 60, 70, 80 percent, I mean, hopefully it's not going to go a lot lower. You know, it can go down another 50, 60, 80 percent, but that would be extremely unlikely in my view. I think, you know, after a period of base building in these high growth stocks, I think we're going to see the next big rally and shareholders, I think, are going to make multiples of their money over the next five, six years. Well said. Peru Saxena, thank you so much for joining us from Hong Kong. I wish you a wonderful evening. Thank you very much. And thank you all for watching. We'll have much more coming your way, so be sure to stay tuned to Stansberry Research. And don't forget uh, to be alerted of the latest videos uh, coming your way to sign up at DanielaCambone.com. Thanks so much for watching. Opinions expressed on this program are solely those of the contributor and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Stansbury Research, its parent company, or affiliates.